Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome. Thanks very much for joining us. We've just been waiting until five past to uh, let people into the uh, room. So um, my name is Professor James Bennett. I am the Director of Story Futures and of the Story Trails Experiment in Augmented Reality, Virtual Reality, and um, a history project that brings history to life where it happened across the UK. We are really excited to have you all here because the thing about Story Trails, which is part of the Unboxed uh, Creativity in the UK Festival taking place next year, is that it can only happen with you. This is a really massive experiment in immersive storytelling in bringing history to life through realizing archives in interesting and creative ways. But we're looking for 50 emerging creatives who are gonna be the key people in telling those stories and making that history happen. Um, we're gonna run through lots of information and most importantly, answer your questions today. But I'm gonna hand over, first of all, to a quick video introduction uh, about the festival and uh, the Unboxed project and story trails um, from Martin Green. Uh, Rebecca Frankel, our Head of Inclusion and Talent, is going to share that with you. So I'll hand over to Rebecca and return to you shortly. Okay. Oh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Um, whoop. Okay. Oh, can you see my screen? It's mm -hmm. not yet. You were sharing it earlier. <laughs> So can you see the unbox video? No. Not yet. Okay, I'm going to play that in a minute then. Um, I'm just going to introduce myself Ooh, quickly. So I'm looking after the uh, talent, all of you guys, um, and... I have a little video to play you in a minute, but first of all, I'm going to introduce you to two of our partners um, who are called David and Damien, who are our delivery partners. Um, so the way this project works is we are looking for creatives to join up and they're going to be working on the field or with companies gathering stories and information and recording them and curating them. And they're going to be part of a bigger output which is going to have quite a lot of technical wizardry to put together and these are the people from the companies who are going to help do that so they are going to tell you a little bit about what they're going to be producing so can we go to david first please yeah, sure. then you must reach, uh, Should be able to see Nexus's logo. Is that visible? Not just yet. There you go. The Nexus. Yep. Great. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm David. I'm a senior interactive producer at Nexus Studio Nexus Studios, uh, and I'm just going to introduce you very quickly to Nexus and who we are, talk about uh, the work that we're doing on this project and then how um, we fit into that. So uh, Nexus is uh, a studio. We have offices in um, LA, uh, London. And hey, but sorry, sorry to interrupt. So we have two technical issues. One is um, your, your audio is just a little off, but two is we just we sorted the video link. So we're going to share that now, which will give greater context for everybody so you can dive in. Okay. No worries. Uh, okay. So uh, forgive everybody, please forgive the, uh, the Zoom technical difficulty. So um, uh, I am going to share my screen and kick off with the video that Rebecca was talking about and um, pull everything back together. So. 
Story trials will bring together augmented reality, new developments in 3D internet technology and young creatives to shape one of the most ambitious people's history and archive projects ever undertaken. Story trials is a unique storytelling experience that will bring to life untold stories from the past, stories of belonging and stories that will reanimate our public spaces, seeking to inspire a UK wide conversation about who we are and where we're going. Town squares, local libraries, streets and cinemas will be transformed into virtual portals through which to explore stories of historical change in 15 locations across the UK in 2022 and, of course, through broadcast and digitally. Storytell's creative team will work closely with communities in each of the towns to uncover unknown, surprising and intriguing stories from the past. Today, the Storytales team begins recruiting 50 paid people from the next generation of UK creative talent who will work closely with individuals and communities to unearth the hidden stories of each city and town. And you can find out more again on unboxed2022.uk. Storytales is led by Story Futures Academy, the UK's National Centre for Immersive Storytelling, which is part of Royal Holloway University of London, and the National Film and Television School. It's delivered in partnership with the British Film Institute, broadcaster and filmmaker David Olashoga, Uplands Television, leading immersive specialist ISO Design and Netflow Studios, and like so much of our programme, the BBC. It will be brought to life in the Reading Agency's National Network of Libraries and by event-making specialist Produce UK. <laughs> So we're going to be doing what Martin said, which is an exciting project to um, be part of. Um, and as I'm sure David will point out, it's not with Nexo Studios, but with Nexus Studios leading the way with uh, one of the key parts of the project, which is a mobile AR trail delivered with Niantic. Now, before I hand over to David and then Damien, let me say just a couple of uh, things about the program that are important for you out there in Zoom now. Number one is, going back to my opening point, this is all about really recruiting 50 amazing people to help tell these stories. And you'll be working with these amazing technologies of immersive that include everything from scanning through to uh, virtual positioning systems that will tell these stories and work with BBC and BFI archives to reanimate those archives into public places in ways that we haven't thought of before. And that's going to be a really exciting part of the project. Um, in that way, one of the key things about the project is we're working with David Olashoga because of two reasons. One, this is a history project, and what better kind of like public historian to engage with public place than David Olashoga? Two is because this is a training and development opportunity that is about changing our creative industries to make them representative of the diversity we aspire to see within those creative industries, which is why Story Futures Academy has teamed up with David, as well as the brilliant team of people from places like Nexus and ISO Design and the Reading Agency and the British Film Institute, because we're about training and developing this emerging set of creatives. This is a scheme for the next step in your creative career that enables diverse talent to stay in the industry, to develop new skills and move into the immersive sector where the UK is going to become a world leader. Story Futures Academy is the National Centre for Immersive Storytelling. We've been running for three years and we have trained over 2,000 people. Um, we have uh, produced over 400 jobs. We've trained um, nearly 1,000 professionals already working in the screen industries. And we've done so with a massive remit for diversity. Over half of our participants are female and just under a quarter are from Black, Asian or ethnic minority backgrounds. We really want to promote diverse talent as part of this scheme. And so we really welcome your interest in it. And we hope we can excite you in taking part in it. I'm going to hand over to David Bradshaw, who's going to explain how the mobile AR trails will work and what that involves. And he'll then hand over to Damien about our immersive maps. Thanks, David. You are on mute. It's classic, it's classic. 
How's that? Better. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll quickly introduce you to Nexus Studios, the work that we'll be doing on the project, and then um, talk how um, you will fit in and how, we, how, how we'll work together. Uh, so Nexus Studios, it was founded in London, but we have offices in um, LA and Sydney. Uh, it was started out as an, an animation studio, but we also do film, um, real-time production, and about 10 years ago, uh, Nexus Interactive Arts was founded, and that's uh, who I sit with in the company. Uh, and we do all things XR, so that's virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. Um, I'm going to just show very, very quickly some of the projects that we've done previously in this space that are relevant for what we're talking about today. Um, so what we've been looking at for quite some time now is um, augmented uh, augmenting um, the world around you in kind of fun interesting and interactive ways uh, so this hot step project was a, a wayfinding uh, mechanism where you could punch in any any address in the world and this character would direct you to get there and that was done with something called dps visual positioning system and that's really relevant to telling hyper stories and the stories that we're looking at here today um, similarly, we did a project in uh, South Korea, uh, Changbok Palace, where you could um, interact with the uh, characters in volumetric video capture and animated characters. And it's all about kind of taking uh, a location which is site specific and the location plays a role in that story. So um, it's, it's contextual and it's relevant to the type of story that you wanted to tell. And that's really key to what we're doing here with storytelling. And then similarly, we did a project over in the States, uh, Dallas Cowboys, where we like, augmented the whole uh, stadium and you could see players uh, outside the stadium, inside the stadium, playing games at halftime. And it's really kind of taking a one-to-one -one, um, physical and digital space and augmented that to create a kind of new so what are AR story trails and how, how is that relevant to, to the things that I've just shown? So what we want to do is to create a, kind of a portal, an opportunity to go back to the past, to relive uh, moments from history using um, the archive, as James said, the BFI archive, the BBC archive, um, so we can kind of revisit the past and learn about um, who we are and, and importantly, who we want to be. But this idea is that we're creating a kind of a portal, a window into the past. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been busy creating an infrastructure in order to uh, bring these stories to life. We won't be telling those stories, you will be telling those stories. So what we need to do in order to make that happen is to create uh, what we're calling um, a kit of parts in order for you to be able to tell your story. So how do you show archive uh, in new and interesting ways? So one example of that is um, you know, TV sets from different periods of history. So say you're telling the story about the 1960s, we can put that in a TV from the 1960s. We're also doing some really, really like interesting and innovative work that unfortunately can't share today using machine learning, which will um, take 2D archive and actually bring that into your space. So it feels contextually relevant. Um, these images that we're seeing here are based on a prototype that we did in Brixton. Uh, as I say, this is just something that we've been experimenting with and we're kind of waiting for you to come on board to actually tell these stories. But by using VPS technology, visual positioning systems, which is what we've done in all of those projects that I started sharing at the beginning there, is create hyper-local stories. And what that means is we can, with um, real accuracy, um, place assets and elements in very specific places. So as you can see in this image on the bottom uh, and left hand corner here, you can have people hanging off buildings or you can have, um, you know, TV sets placed in a very specific place or, or like other, other assets. And why that's important and why that's relevant is 
is that these um, stories belong in these places. So we're actually kind of taking them out where the archive normally sits, where you might see it in, uh, on a TV screen or a cinema, and you can see that anywhere. It's like, we want to tell stories about Brixton in Brixton. We want to tell stories about Dundee in Dundee. And actually, you can see footage that was perhaps filmed there um, in the street that it was filmed and actually kind of relive that moment in history. Um, Here's another example of what I was saying we're able to do with this kind of hyper-local, uh, very accurate storytelling is, you know, we can project um, archive on the side of buildings. Maybe that um, what we can see here in the screen was filmed inside that home and now we can actually see that come to life and actually on the outside of the building. Um, this is another example of what we're doing with the kit, and par kit of parts. So, Perhaps you want to present um, quotes or like meaningful passages from um, characters from history, the stories that you want to tell. So what we're doing is we're creating all these different ways and all these different kind of artistic expressions for you to choose um, how you want to tell your story. Um, another example of that is um, images. You know, say if we wanted to show an, uh, a gallery of images, how would we do that? So here we've got this old um, film reel and you can click on that and then you'll be able to see like all of these images uh, come to life. So that might be one way that you wish uh, to tell your story. And what we're doing is we're kind of over indexing on and, and kind of leaning into um, these kind of big fun oversized objects. So you'll see like a big huge, you know, television or a big huge um, film reel or, or any of that kind of stuff. Um, so it feels kind of, uh, very fun and, and tactile. Um, another thing that we're looking at is um, we really want the audience to be able to contribute to the story. So this is something that we're looking at, which is called Hope Notes. And we're able to ask a question of the audience and then be able to contribute and be part of that story. So what I'd encourage you to, to think is, you know, what questions do you want to ask of your community in relation to the stories that you're telling? So you, you show them uh, archive as stimulus, and then, you know, we can ask them, how do you feel about this? How does this make you feel? Like, how does, what, what note would you like to send yourself in the future? And you can be able to type that in with this big oversized typewriter and actually see that kind of manifest in augmented reality in the digital space. Um, Again, similarly, this is, this is a little bit more uh, of the, that hope note mechanic, um, how it might look in app where you can type in this note and then you'll be able to see it um, visualized in space. So imagine going to your, your town and your city and be able to see all of these notes of hope and encouragement um, that you asked of your community and then they've kind of contributed. So it's this kind of collective, um, idea of whether it be you know solidarity or support or whatever the question you want to ask and whatever the people choose to respond to. Uh, similarly we're looking at um, voice notes so uh, you can record a note and have it uh, and listen to it back and be able to see that and you can discover it along the trail and kind of tune in using this big radio to other people's contributions um, so it's almost like you're, you're, you're tuning into your community. Um, as I said, we're kind of creating a guide and a kit of parts. So this is just one example that I'm sharing is what we're doing is we're putting together materials which will help you um, tell your story. So you'll be able to pick from archive and, and quotes and video and audio and 3D text and all of these different things in order to construct the story that you want to tell. So that's what we're busy doing at the moment is creating these kind of guides and these materials. Um, very quickly, because I know we've not got much time, how will we work together? So as I've said, we're creating these guides, we're creating this infrastructure in order for you to be able to tell your story. So what we're waiting for is for you to come and come up with your stories, which we'll work together on uh, with the help of Story Futures. And then using this kit of parts that we've developed, um, you'll make those kind of creative decisions or design decisions about how your stories will kind of plot out in the physical space, um, contextually relevant to the location, very accurate, hyper-local using the VPS technology, 
uh, and then we will have these trails across 15 towns and cities where uh, you can go and discover these stories and unearth these stories from your communities. That's it for me. Uh, look forward to like answering a few of your questions later. Uh, and if you want to learn more about Nexus, please check out our website and socials. We're on all of that stuff, so you can find more about the work. Thanks, David. Uh, if we can invite uh, Damien to come and talk a little bit about our immersive maps. Damien? Sure. I'll just uh, share my screen. Give me a thumbs up if you can see that. Thumbs up. Great. OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for your time. Great to see so much interest. That's all very exciting. Um, I so again, uh, similar to David, you'll find all our work online, but we basically create big immersive installations. We do these as usually location-based. Uh, we mainly work in kind of cultural heritage, brand experiences. Um, and a lot of our work is how do you find innovative ways of telling stories using new digital tools and technologies. Um, this is a great project for us because it touches all those things that get us very excited. And the brief for us is very simple in that the Storyscaper community, of which you guys will hopefully start, um, um, be, be those 50 people on the ground, you're going to be developing workshops on the ground embedded in 15 different towns and cities across the UK. Uh, we're looking for diverse and unusual stories. These are, in effect, our digital documentaries. And as I say, we're going to scatter you from the, the four corners of the, uh, of the UK. And then the final work we create is going to become this UK tour. We're going to revisit each of those towns. We're going to drop into the, each town for a weekend, create a whole load of immersive attractions um, from Nexus's AR app, David's film, VR installations, and the main piece of work that I saw creating, which is the spatial maps, where we're going to try and use people's personal stories to create a new story map of the UK. And you'll access that via a big immersive screening um, area, but also interactive kiosks where we can literally let visitors access hundreds and hundreds of stories. So our part of the project is looking at a large volume. We're looking at ways in which we can capture a huge amount of people's personal and uh, unusual stories. And, and a big thing for us is about accessibility. One of the reasons why this will ultimately be screenings uh, and interactive kiosks is you don't need any technology to engage with this part of the project. So that's a very important thing in our remit. At the core of our project is what we think is the real tool for storytelling now, which is the smartphone. Uh, we want to leverage some of the really exciting new kind of features that are coming out around uh, 3D scanning, especially using LiDAR. Um, and that's going to become the tool that you're going to use to build these stories. And how are we going to do that? We're going to train you. You don't need any experience in this. We're going to train you in how to 3D scan, literally using the phone in your pocket. You'll be supplied with the kit, uh, the, 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 the support on the ground, pre-briefings before you arrive in the city, and then you'll be sent out to kind of research and capture a whole range of stories. But what we do is we don't just capture the people we're going to interview. We want to capture their environments. We want to show that location is as important to these stories as the individuals. So you will, in effect, capture and we will work with you to build new cities, new towns. And our building blocks are the scans you create, the audio stories you capture. So in many ways, this is almost like a new form of documentary creation. These will be short form. You know, we don't imagine these stories being much more than one or two minutes. But as I say, we're going to be looking at creating hundreds of these across the UK. When we actually start to bolt those together, we do build these kind of new kind of domestic and, and, and urban environments. It allows us to embed archive. Um, BFI and the BBC are both partners on the project. And it allows us to reflect on both the history of the UK with what is happening right now. And we want to show a whole range of how places and people's lives have changed in response to these kind of archival moments. So we'll get a chance to use your bits and pieces to kind of build these new towns. We've done a couple of pilots already. Um, one example here is Blackpool. We've actually built the kind of the, um, the waterfront at Blackpool there. 
uh, the Pleasure Beach, um, Blackpool Tower. As you'll see, these aren't scans of the actual buildings. We're using those basic building blocks of the individual stories and locations to create a new kind of fantastical vision of the UK. So we'll be using that as a, 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 as a different way of introducing personal tales. Um, I've got one minute, I think, so I'm going to show you a very short clip from Lewisham. I'll just let this play out. So once we actually get these kind of cities built in a real-time game environment, it means we can then add audio, voiceover, and feature the kind of the people that you will have researched. I think the audio is not playing through, Damien. All right, okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, you get the idea anyway. We can build those kind of towns. And then the final um, realization of this is the tour, where this kind of pop up immersive space, this immersive cinema in effect, will travel back around the UK and we'll get a present, a, a, an opportunity to present people's stories back to those communities. And that's us. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Um, it still looks awesome every time I see it. Um, <laughs> So we really are here um, now um, for the remainder of the time to answer questions. Um, and, and that really is the, the key uh, reason to be here. So Rebecca, do you want to, um, so I hand over to you and we'll run through a few of them and um, Damien and David will be around for a little bit to answer any questions. Um, but they'll have to dive off a bit earlier, but um, out there in Zoom land, please do stay for as long as it takes for us to answer these questions. Yeah, we're going to try and get through and answer everything that's come in. Um, it's quite a strange project. Ooh. Can you, you can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, we, we want to make it really clear what, um, what we're talking about. So, first of all, the term creative media practitioner Um means we're interested in people who are engaged in storytelling in a kind of way where they gather stories and they create them into some kind of format to share with others. So the easiest way to conceptualize that might be someone who's a radio producer or a documentary filmmaker or makes theater, but equally it might be somebody who um, creates dance experiences or does community arts projects or somebody who's really good at working with finding people to tell stories that get passed down through songs and share them. So the way that we like to describe it is it's about having transferable skills in storytelling um, and some media experience in terms of being able to produce an output that you can share with others. Um, we This is a scheme that's open for people who've already got some experience. So we're looking for people who've got at least three years experience. They can work with other people um, and that it's not for complete beginners. Um, you do need to be over 18. And we keep using this word emerging. A lot of questions came in about that. And what that means is it's not for beginners. It's for people who've worked on professional projects with other people or they've been making their own projects already so they understand the idea of having a production process and they're looking for a step up they're looking for maybe their first credit as a producer or to really have some more autonomy or to work with a bigger team so we really want to yeah attract people who are like eager to excel and get to that next level of whatever it is that they're doing um in terms of age, there isn't an age limit because people start things at different times and we're really keen to hear from diverse people. And I've had inquiries from a couple of people who have worked in media or done something and they've taken a few years out. Maybe they've done something else. Maybe they were caring for children or someone else in their family. We're very eager to hear from people who want that step up. So emerging just means You've done some stuff for a couple of years and you want to do some more stuff. We're not age specific. However, we got a question about whether you can be from the US. You do need for this scheme to have the right to work in the UK. The way that it, it will work 
from a contracting perspective is you will be contracted as a freelancer. So you do need to have the right to work in the UK and be set up as a freelancer so you can get paid. Um, and then one more question before I pass over to James for a few is whether you can apply as a duo. The way this contracting works is you, we contract a named individual. So you can't generally apply as a duo um, unless there's a highly specific reason, but we would be contracting one person. So really it's a scheme for one person. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to James now for some. Thanks, Rebecca. So we're trying to we're trying to track through all your questions as we go. So I'm tracking back to one from Dylan Drummond, um, who asked about the BBC archives are very limited when it comes to your city. And, and Dylan, you've talked about Dundee, but that might be true for other cities as well. Um, and you said there are better archives that are far more representative. So this is a project that is about bringing BFI and BBC archives to life. We do have to work within the limitations of those archives because this is a national media project with their um, support. But these are not the only archives that we can use on the project. Um, these are the archives that we have deals with that are usable creatively and license wise for this environment. Um, there'll be as as you know as we kind of get into more detail with the project if you were selected we'll be able to provide more detail around what kinds of other archives would be possible and generic rights clearances this is all about being able to work with exciting um, archive but also being able to deliver within a clear time frame so that's why the project is based around these two archives where we've got existing deals um, but we do hope that the format will allow other archives to be brought in. So hopefully that asks uh, a question that a number of people will be interested in. Um, Sarah Lloyd Winder asks, will this project you all use archive footage or will you also be recording people today? So I think hopefully Damien's presentation has given you some sense of that. And Damien, do you just want to um, say a little bit about how there's a bit of, with the map, there's a dialogue between past and present? Yeah, I mean, one opportunity we get, obviously, the work that the story mappers are capturing is right now. We're really keen to capture kind of UK right now, people's present stories. But having these kind of incredible archives, which have been pre-researched before you guys hit the ground, will give you something to kind of reflect on. So one area where you might want to research stories is if there is amazing footage for a certain venue, we could arrange for you to revisit that venue, share that archive, and it might just be the reflections of today's users of that space, which then becomes the stories. So there's lots of trigger points where we can kind of use the, the BFI and BBC content as a kind of uh, a touch point. Um, and then, I mean, one of the beauties of building this kind of, these kind of new story cities is that we can then create the big screening area, the big communal cinema area, the club space. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for us to include the, the present. People can be talking about the past and we actually then can use that archive to kind of visualise that. Thanks, Damien. Um, where am I now? So <laughs> Jeremy asks, um, uh, will these ARs shown by Nexus be available on different platforms like phones and headsets or are they made with a specific output in mind? So, um, David, do you want to take that? Yeah, of course. Um, thanks for the question, Jeremy. I just responded to that, actually. I've just been tapping away in the background. Um, the mobile AR component that I was speaking about is limited to mobile devices. Um, so we don't plan that to be kind of multi-platform in, in terms of wearables or anything, at least at, at this point in time. Um, but there is different components to this project. Um, and I think it was mentioned up top, there is a VR component to this project. So you can watch content from this project on VR headsets, which will be available in the libraries. And similarly, Damien was talking about um, his the work that they're doing in the kiosks. So there's, there's multiple entry points to, to kind of engage with the Storytales project, whether it be with a mobile device, whether it be a VR headset, or the kiosks that Damien was talking about. Thanks, David. Um... And also from Jeremy, we'll be able to update the archives and experiences as more people interact with them locally. Here comes my dog. Um, <laughs> you, the, um, 
I think that at the moment the plan is to keep those art those things um, uh, static. Um, it's something that we'll keep under review, but at the moment the archives would be something that is static. But it's something we're looking at at the moment. Um, I am going to hand back to Rebecca for a next uh, couple of questions. Rebecca, is that all right? I yeah. Think we're about Eleven in our list. Yeah. Okay, so our next question is about the stories. Do creatives come in with the stories or will that be part of the research process? And that's from Rachel. And another similar one is, will the application process ask for examples of stories? So the application form, try to make really, really simple. You can probably do it in about 20, 15 minutes. You just upload your CV and it's just talking about what your experience is and what your transferable skills are and a little bit about kind of, you know, where you're from in terms of mapping you against the places. However, if you're shortlisted for interview, we will be interested in the story element. You don't have to have a story that directly relates to you in a place, but what you do need is the ability to tell stories. So there will be a, a task, a short task at the interview where you will maybe be given a bit of material and asked to highlight what you think is a compelling story. Um, so you don't yet need to come pre-planned already with stories, but you should definitely be thinking about them. Somebody asked about whether they can, stories could be from rural voices on the edge of the city. Um, yes, they can. We're interested to, to look at diverse stories from across the UK. And we've specifically chosen locations which are, are different sizes, just for logistical reasons. We can't really situate ourselves right in the middle of the countryside, but we're definitely interested to hear rural stories. Someone's asked, can the story be about the person who's chosen for this project? Um, that's a yes, no, totally depends. We, you know, if you've got a connection to a place and you've got a great story that you can access that you may be involved with, in all likelihood, it will be involved if it's a great story. Um, but they're not going to be, the point of these is collecting a multitude of different voices. So it's unlikely you'd apply and the whole project would be just yours. Um, but we're really looking for people who feel they've got an untold story um and you'd be based someone's asked would you be based in one location or in several places you'll be based in one location just to explain briefly about how this works we're in 15 locations across the uk and in each location we're going to be picking two people so david and damien who you both heard from are making different outputs in each location one person is going to be creating the AR trail. So that role is probably more focused on looking at the archive that already exists and historical stories that exist in places and piecing together narratives that can fit into a narrative-led experience that somebody would do in a place. So that's really great for people who are interested in thinking about meta-narratives and pulling threads of stories together and are good at working critically with the archive that already exists. However, this project is so focused on also what stories have not been told. And that's where we're doing this immersive map. So that, if you're working on that project, it will be much more about looking critically at the archive. We can totally still use the archive, but it's also about what's missing. What kind of people have we not heard from? Who's been edited out or omitted or just not listened to? And on that strand, it will be much more focused on, rather than going through the archives with a critical eye, it will be going through the towns and the places and looking at who you should speak to. And that's why we're doing the scanning so you can scan people. And because we really want to get diversity, as in lots of different voices, that map will have a lot of different stories that will be more like fragments. So sorry, that was a bit of a long one, but it's an important one. And then if you don't have an iPhone, that's fine. We provide the equipment that you need for this project. Okay, should I, do you want to do some of the next questions, James? Sure. Um, okay, so where are we at? So you've done another, so um, 
how will the process of researching and finding participants work um, from Rosie? Rosie, that is a good question. Essentially, um, the process will be thought about as kind of um, maybe two or three stages. And the first stage is all about um, training and making sure that um, the people that we select for the uh, program have got all the right tools to deliver the project. Alongside that, we're doing some background research about the archive and about the towns and about the interests of those towns, lots of focus groups around those towns of interest of stories, what kind of communities already exist. And that will be building together essentially a briefing pack for the selected story mappers uh, who work in those towns. So um, it's a kind of it's a kind of joint process, really, by where whereby we're providing you with a lot of information from which to choose, and then guiding you into that process. So if you think about the um, Story Futures uh, team as being an editorial uh, resource to guide that process and make sure that what we provide is coherent and compelling across the whole thing, it's a collaborative effort. Um, uh, with lots of help along the way, uh, all of the uh, people selected for uh, the uh, roles will have producers overseeing and working with them on their role. Um, uh, Rachel, Rachel, you ask, I'm not completely clear how the two visions work together, i.e. the toolkit the Nexus is providing and the digital twin type cityscapes that ISO are offering. Thanks for that question. Essentially, these are end outputs for the audience. So um, when uh, people come to our experience of Unboxed next summer, which Damien talked about briefly as we'll be running a tour through the 15 locations, starting up in Omar and ending up in Lewisham. Um, each city, each town will have a two day tour where we will turn up and people can come to their library and experience a multimedia immersive uh, set of experiences. So we'll be running regular tours of the mobile AR experience where people can go on a walking tour and experience story trails out in location in your town. But also in the library, there'll be an amazing touchscreen set of experiences and huge um, kind of uh, big immersive screen. Whereas Damien was saying, you don't need to have any technology at all. You can turn up and watch these experiences. So the end output is they both use archive and history and community storytelling differently, but for the end audience, it's about having a kind of exciting weekend inside the library, reimagined as an immersive history portal. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Rachel. Um, Owen, are the stories that would be collected to be historical, personal, or both? They have much, they've got to be kind of both, but the pers you know, the personal is historical, but also uh, essentially it's going to become a public story. So a personal story needs to be something that can feel resonant with audiences, not just in that UK town, but across the UK. So um, the mobile <coughs> AR experience will best be experienced in the town itself, but it is something that I could do, for example, in my home in Brighton, even though the trail was based in Omar. And equally, the, uh, the emotional map that we're creating will be uh, able to be accessed elsewhere. So we're looking for great stories that will engage people in their town, but also speak across the UK. Um, I think that's where I'm up to on my list, number tw 20, number 20, from Lenny, that's right, yeah, from Lenny, who owns the copyright? Good question, Lenny. Um, so we'll be, there's, there's a lot of copyright involved in this project, including the archive copyright for which licenses will be granted for the project and for story trails. The same will be clearing copyright from the, from the creatives for the app and the installation. I think essentially there's a piece of work still to be done on how we can make sure that the underlying rights to the story can be exploited by the emerging creatives on other platforms, which hopefully is what you want to hear. Um, we've got to work those things through. But for the purposes of the experiences we're creating, they'll need to be subsumed into the Storytales project. Um, I am, I'm up to that question about what you, if you don't have an iPhone, which I think you have answered, Rebecca. Do you want to yeah. pick up from there? Sure. Um, I just want to, yeah, answer a question that has come in a few different guises, which is about the production period. Just want to explain how this scheme works. Um, you apply. 
we shortlist you, you have an interview. If you're successful, you then come on board and we give you training and then you start production, which sounds simple, but I just want to pull apart a little bit what that means. So the training is about two weeks, it's about 10 days training. Some of it's going to be in person and some of it's remote and we'll cover the costs for you to attend that training and um, have food and things like that. The production period is, you should consider it 10 weeks full-time on the ground production period. And you need to be in the location for that period. And that is basically gathering intel, meeting people. After that 10 weeks full-time, we've scheduled that you have 10 weeks part-time. And that is because when Damien and David are putting together their projects, they might have, they might say, that's a brilliant story. I want more coverage of it. Or I want another interview from somebody like that. So in terms of how it, it runs, you should think of it as 10 weeks full time and 10 weeks part time. Um, so. the Yeah, I've explained that. Um, oh, I think I'm, that's that's what I'm up to with the questions, actually. What have you got now, James? Good question. Um, I have got number 22. I've lost the name of who's asked this question, so apologies, but somebody's asked a very good question. Can these stories be collected from rural voices on the edges of the city? Is there a geographical limit? Um, I'm going to answer that question as both yes and no. So, um, yes, they can be collected from rural voices on the edge of the cities. That would be super welcome. And the maps that Damien has shown, they are... Um, emotional geographies, they're psycho geographies of the place. They are not literal geographies. So we want them to sprawl. We want them to be elastic. We want them to be creative. We want them to draw in voices from all over the place. On the other hand, a walking tour has to have a limited <laughs> uh, range of uh, places that it can go. So our maps, our emotional maps can be really diverse and really, really grow the city. Our walking mobile AR tours will be and David, correct me if I'm wrong here, about a three mile radius is kind of like, they need to have some connection to places within a three mile radius of the library in order to make a walking tour. David, am I right in saying that? Yeah, I think so. Because the library is, is the kind of hub, it is the event space, um, which we're, we're looking at stories that can be told within uh, a limited area around the library. Um, for reasons of accessibility, you know, not everyone can walk long distances. Uh, that's not to say that if there's a, a story point or a piece of archive that is from the region and it is, is relevant, it, it can't be used. But I think, as I was saying about kind of hyperlocal and contextually relevant stories, I think we would encourage you to, to find stories and find archives that can, that can link back to these kind of uh, spaces within in and around the libraries, but it's, you know, there are exceptions, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the production period because we've had other questions come in. Um, if you go to the website, we actually answered a lot of questions and provided all of the information about the timelines. If you go on the frequently asked questions, but the way that we work with production is it's split into two. So next summer, when these go on tour, they're going to travel from the top of the country down to the bottom. So the ones more north need to be produced earlier. So the first half of this project is in the most northerly locations. will have their training begin in January and then they will be in production in the end of January and working for the next few months. Whereas the people who are on the more southerly locations will have their training in March. So it will be staggered and they'll start a little bit later. All of the dates are on the website. Um, and people have asked kind of what you mean by full time. It's what we, it, it, it's not, it, you can kind of consider it nine to five. If you've ever done sort of work in the field, you know, you're expected that, that you're not doing any other paid work during that period. In the part-time period, there'll be flexibility if you've got other commitments because it will be more about picking things up, developing things, um, and you can work that around other, other um, things you might have on at the moment. Um, and yeah, in terms of location, in that full-time period, it would be really good to be living 
in or near the location. So if you're an hour away and you're happy to commute, that's completely fine. Thanks. Um, so um, various other questions coming in, lots of them that keep them coming, please do. Um, a, a question that's coming different guises, but essentially how important is it for a creative to have a specific connection to one of the 15 cities? It's really important. Um, you need we need people who are able to talk with um, with with a with a clear sense that they understand a city's culture. Now, a city's culture is always diverse. It's always it's never monolithic. It's always you know coming from multiple places. But we need to have a sense that you understand um, parts of that. And so we're looking for strong connections whereby you'll be able to talk to people in those communities. Um, you'll be able to uh, connect with them and tell stories that resonate with those people. That isn't a skill that means you have to be born in one of those cities, you know, um, it, but it is, a, it is something where you need to have had a strong connection with one of those places. Maybe it's the place where every single year for a number of years you went on holiday. Maybe it's the place where you lived for a, a period of time or you worked for a period of time or um, you've got some other connection that shows how your um, how you're able to work with that location. Um, there's a question about uh, where the funding it comes from. Um, in the chat, we've put the link to Unbox 2022, which is the, uh, um, the program of work being created via um, the team led by Martin Green and funded by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Um, so our funding comes ultimately from DCMS. Um, and um, so hopefully that's clear, but you can have a look at the link, which provides a bit more detail about that. Great question uh, about in terms of tone, um, about whether these are expecting to be uplifting or can we expect something a bit uh, grittier? Um, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, so we can accommodate something that is a bit grittier. Um, these are stories where um, overall we're looking to celebrate, we're looking to kind of create a, a moment of hope and optimism, but um, you can only be optimistic and hopeful about the past, the future by looking at where you come from and looking at where we've come from is not all uh, rose tinted glasses. This is a, a project in which history has uncomfortable parts in it and we're not going to shy away from those. And we're trying to create this multimedia experience. It's got different access points to it. It's got different ways of people to find their way in and delve into deeper, more grittier stories. But also if you're just looking for something that is a bit lighter, there'll be stuff there for you too. So it should be eclectic from our point of view. Um, and we can do that. The one, the one limitation that you have to think about with a gritty story is that still this will be um, experiences that are open to families on a weekend taking over a library. So, you know, how we tell a gritty story will be limited, but a gritty story itself is not off the cards. Um, let me see. Can you explain the curatorial process? Will Scottish or Northern Irish uh, Irish stories be subject to curatorial decisions made elsewhere? I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but essentially there's an editorial um, board that will be reviewing all of the story processes that we go through. Um, that will include representation from across nations and regions. Um, uh, and obviously we've been working hard with um, our Scottish and Northern Irish counterparts to make sure the project can talk with stories that will work in those places and a lot of work goes into that. Um, so I'm hoping that understands, but if you've asked that question, you want to um, uh, have a dialogue in the Q&A or you want to just reach out to us to understand better, please do. Yeah. Um, I might just say something to that. Um, so Story Futures is part of Royal Holloway University and one of our other sort of internal partners working on this is the kind of we've got a history hub. So there's an internal history department. So this is actually a project that is originating from people who've got a rigorous academic historical critical perspective. So the editorial is sitting with 
with that kind of place rather than looking at, oh, how can you make this be a sort of a sensational thing? We're looking for thorough research that's critically examining, you know, what is a historical artifact and how are you sourcing stories? Um, I've got a question that's come up a couple of times about how supported are we to clear certain pre-post-production requirements like release forms and interviews? Um, in the training that we're going to give you, we're going to really try and support you with everything that might come up that you need to know. So we're going to give practical training on how you look at archive and we're also going to give you support for things you're going to need to do in the field, such as forms, and you will have things like forms. You will also have a layer of support. There's going to be four producers that will be working with you to help in the field. So if there's practical issues, they can answer, they'll help train you, and they're also a sounding board. So you're not like dispatched into the middle of nowhere. There's very much a support system. So you can talk to people about practical issues as well as editorial ones. Um, as, yeah, Joe's just asked, is there a certain audience we're aiming for? We're aiming, we're aiming for a wide audience, but we are aiming for sort of um family, young people. Um, it's a, a, initially going to be a UK-based audience because it's touring in the UK. Um yeah, do you do, yeah, do you want me to? Did you want to say something about what's going to happen to the projects next year? Next year, like how will they be seen and where and what will happen after the tour? Yeah, I think there are, um, as usual, a couple of answers to that at this stage. There are the, the mobile AR app will still be available after the tour finishes and will be something that we uh, will, will live on like any app um, as far as, as, as for as long as we can possibly make it live on. The festival or Unboxed itself is looking to create a legacy archive of all, um, we're one of 10 projects. Hi David, thanks for joining. Um, the, uh, so there will be a legacy archive. The shape of that isn't clear yet, but our aim is to make the maps and the mobile AR um, experiences uh, available um, for at least three to five years. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of like, technology dependent, um, various other things dependent, but the aim is they don't disappear straight away. And that with luck, it's something that uh, grows and develops over time. Um, so hopefully that the aim is that this is not going to sort of finish at the end of next summer. We're certainly going to see this continue into 2023. Um, okay. I'm going to answer two more questions that have come in. Um, Jez has asked, can the creative practitioner also be involved in the story making process? audience experience e.g with Damien and David and their teams after shooting yeah very much that's why we structured this that it's 10 weeks go out gather stuff and then we've got this 10 weeks part-time period where you will be working in collaboration with what they need so we it, it, it's the way it works with digital productions is it's it, it's not a linear process and we're going to have to look at where attention is as the things are being developed um Somebody has got a question about whether this is a whether the um, creative story maker is acting like a curator um, and wants to know what artistic freedom you've got to construct the how you connect the voices which are unseen or unheard. Um, so this is a that's an interesting question. And to be honest, it differs a little bit between the two projects on the AR trails. You've got a trail and a story. And so there needs to be a narrative that runs throughout. So if you've kind of got a random story, it's hard to connect it in unless you do digging and you can find a way to narratively construct it in. But the whole reason why we're doing the immersive maps um, is so that people, producers on the ground, have got an ability to curate a really wide selection of different voices. And even if they don't kind of stick together in a narrative way, we can, we're really keen to explore some different ways to tag things or based on feelings or maybe based on places you might choose to work in a particular park and gather lots of stories from people who pass through there. So we're really looking for people to apply who really want to think about how you would curate things that don't immediately sit together. So that's a really great question. 
Holly Moy asks, is there ongoing mentoring that goes on after the production in terms of career, career progression? Yes, there'll be a training period at the start of the project. There'll be a mentoring period throughout the extensive production period that Rebecca's talked about. And then at the end, there will be a, um, a kind of like career progression development um, uh, training section. So that will all be part of the project. Um, Deborah asks, how will the BBC, BBC support this project? They will, yes, yes and yes is the answer to those questions. Yes, they will um, be on radio stations and regions, calls to action. Um, we're in ongoing conversations about uh, how that looks, but we've already done some work with BBC Radio and television. Um, and uh, one of the great things about the project is as the project um, uh, kind of like does its tour, it will also have a film um, from David Olashoga kind of coming in behind it. So it will kind of like amplify the project again um, after the summer tour, which is exciting. So um, it's a project that's got real legs and life to it. Um, um, we've got a question about whether you can work with communities and share people's realities who choose not to tell them in English. Um, yes. Um, we're keen to engage with a wide range of people and there will be support available to speak to people who can't speak in English. But I would throw that back out at you and say, um, we would also, if you want to do that, be wanting you to engage with how you can creatively use that material. You know, we can, of course, speak to someone, interview them. We could use subtitles, but with all this exciting new technology, there's lots of cool stuff you can do. So it would be really great to be having a think about how you can make non-English -lang non language testimony accessible to people who are listening to it in English in exciting ways. Um, and we've got a question from someone about theatre and storytelling and creative writing as a background. That's fine. You can totally apply for this. As, a, as we keep saying, it's about the ability to see stories. So it's factual storytelling, how to spot good things and put them together into a narrative that works for one of these two formats. Um, let's see. Um, so it's a couple of link questions, one from Sarah Garrod and another from uh, C which are basically the same question around how supported are we to clear certain pre post production requirements, e.g. release forms for interviewees, et cetera. So we'll be creating all of those release forms, but the person on the ground will be having to gather those. That's where your producer will come in to work closely with you to make sure that you get all of that sort of documentation um, done properly. But that is uh, whether you like it or, or don't like it, I suppose one of the things about the career progression is that this is the, the kind of opportunity of creating those stories and making sure that you have skills in developing those clearances because I guess like with a factual storytelling project, having those skills for kind of like copyright clearance, whether it be for archive or people's um, living stories is very much part of the process. So um, hopefully that gives you a sense of the answer there is you will be doing some of that work but you will have a lot of support in doing it including making sure that we're holding your hand to get it done right um, da, 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 da. um someone's asking about the length of the stories um again it varies between the different the two different strands with the immersive maps um that damien was talking at in the pilot, we found stories that are about two minutes are the optimum length for that format. The AR trails are kind of longer stories, but there's a lot of experimenting that can go on. So it will be about, yeah, collecting different stories and seeing what works. Um, someone's asked about the selection process. So when you fill in your application, the applications will go to, each application will be seen by three judges and they'll be seen blind. So they won't see your name and they won't see any of the confidential information about you. They'll only see your, well, they'll see your CV and your experience and what you answer in relation to the two questions we ask about where you're from and whether you've faced any barriers. Um, after they are shortlisted, they get scored, they get cross-referenced. This is all done blind. Then there's a panel who meet 
and have a look at them and it's reviewed again. So it's quite a thorough selection um, and it's it's deliberately done in a way where everyone is looked at thoroughly and we will be yet yeah, meeting to make sure we interview a really good selection at the interview stage. We're really interested to hear from people who don't normally apply for schemes and we're not going to just be taking people who are really good at filling in application forms. We are really going to take the, the time to dig a bit deeper on people's experience. Um, um, let's see. So someone's asked, can we do video audio applications or is it just writing? The form is a written form. If you need um, some help or assistance or would prefer to do it in a different format, you can email and we can assist. The email is storytrails at storyfutures.ac.uk. All that information is on the web page. Uh, Nettie Scriven asks, is the 50 days production process all about gathering stories? Uh, largely it's about gathering stories, but it's also about writing those stories into the formats of the mobile AR trails and the city map. So it's a mixture of gathering stories um, and depending on what work stream you're doing, different types of scanning and working with different types of um, what might be thought of as easily as post-production technologies um, uh, and obviously training as well. So it'll be uh, reasonably varied, but there'll be a fair bit amount of time on the ground uh, collecting stories and then turning those into bigger narratives um, and working out how to how to how to kind of like really engage people with stories that have got emotional heart and good story beats. One thing to say is that you know this is a, these roles involve a fair amount of time on the ground um, in both. Uh, in both senses being on location uh, at one of the 15 towns, but also they do involve a fair amount of walking around in different ways because they, whether you're creating a map or you're creating a, um, uh, a mobile AR trail, they involve a fair amount of mobility around the space to make sure that you can scan and capture those. Um, it is something, obviously, if you have mobility uh, requirements, we can talk through, but it is kind of like just an alert, of like there is a fair amount of moving around these spaces in order to capture them. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Joe um, asked about what kind of examples are helpful if you're applying, if you're a documentary filmmaker and you do things on the side, um, or you've got experience with VR. Um, so I've deliberately done the form in such a way that it's not just a list of TV credits. We're really interested in people who who do projects themselves as a hobbyist or with their friends. And you can just tell us about it in your own words. So the way the application form works is it's just an open box and you can write, you can put links. Um, we're not looking for huge extended show reels or anything like that, but you can just tell us in whatever way and words uh, you like. Um. Oh, and then whether you you do so we we've got 30 roles going on this and you will be in one of two positions you'll either be working on the immersive map or you'll be working on the ar trail it is kind of one or the other however we're going to have two people in each location and depending on you know how you get along the dream would be that it can be quite collaborative and the same story might make it into both outputs but as a practitioner you would be working on one particular stream rather than both um what else have we got uh half said nabe um talks about um the creative story maker individual on the ground uncovering voices is acting like a curator in some way um, I expect you want the story maker to act with their own agency and my concern is less with copyright and more with artistic freedom to construct a place full of voices previously unseen or unheard. You mentioned working with the producer. So can you speak a bit about that role? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. So um, 
The answer is, I guess, we have a story format that all of the stories will need to fit within. And we want that, that format will be elastic to a degree, but it has to be something that can turn around within our production timeline, work with the creative tool sets that we have to hand and fit with the overall vision for story trails um, as a project that's been commissioned by Unboxed and by DCMS. So the individual... Um, uh, story mapper on the ground will have a great deal of artistic freedom, but they will not have total artistic freedom and control. So it's really important to kind of say that this is not a project where you would have total artistic freedom and control. You will have guided artistic freedom and control. Um, and we're looking to enable that and work that really you work with a format that does scale and reaches um, people in large uh, audiences. So um, I hope that answers the question. Okay, um, a great question that's come in. You've spoken about 50 creatives and you've also spoken about 30 creatives. What do you mean? Who are the other 20? So that's a, yeah. So we've got 30 places on this scheme, 15 locations, two people in each. On top of that, we've also got 20 placements, which are a bit more of a traditional placement where you're placed in a company. So half of them are with BR companies. So we are working with nine companies who are going to be making a three to 10 minute prototype for Oculus Quest. And you could apply on a separate form and it's a separate link within the same section on the same website to work to do a VR placement. And that would be for the kind of person who maybe is already a digital designer, maybe does sound design, maybe you do narrative design and storytelling, and you want to learn to apply that in a um, virtual reality production workflow. So that's half of the additional places. And then the other half of the additional places are, we've got placements with the companies who are working on this project. So with Nexus and ISO, who you just heard from, they've both got two placements open. We've got a placement open, the BFI have got a placement open, and those are also live on our website now. And those are, yeah, more traditional, you're probably in a company for three, four, five months, and you are, working in the capacity that you work, but hopefully getting exposure to a sort of world-class company. Thanks. Um, and uh, you can apply to as many, you can apply to all, all streams. Please do, please do. Um, yeah, please do apply to more than one stream uh, and to more than one opportunity if you've got the skills, we'd love, we'd love you to. Alex Pearson, just uh, dialing back up a few uh, answers, questions, trying to get through them all. Uh, Alex Pearson asks, about using other mechanics beyond what you've heard today. Um, Alex, the answer is there are more mechanics than what we've been able to show today, partly because it's confidential and partly because some of these uh, technologies are in development, but you will be working with a creative toolkit built by us. We won't be incorporating new mechanics built by somebody else. Um, they are, these are, these are, um, uh, essentially as close to platforms as you can think about as ways to telling spatialized storytelling. So we won't be looking to develop a new touchscreen interaction or a new uh, camera technique, but there will be more than what you have seen today. Um, there's some really exciting stuff going on with the project. Um, so uh, I hope that answers the question, but unfortunately it's probably, it's not a, a dev opportunity to try out new mechanics, I'm afraid. Um, Below that, uh, somebody's asked about BSL, captioning creatively within the technology. Um, no, you won't learn how to do that specifically, although if you're working closely with uh, Nexus or ISO, that may become an opportunity on one of the placements, but it's not part of the wider program of works. Uh, obviously, there are opportunities as you develop through the program to develop specific skills. Rebecca, do you want to pick out a couple? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I'm just going back through. Yeah, if there's a theme or topic you want to explore, yes, do mention it in the application. We've got a question where we ask about that. Um, da, 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 da. I think we've kind of answered all of them now. Um, uh, thank you for the anonymous tip on Roma. We're trying, we're trying. 
Um, uh, Joe, so there's a digital street theatre performer. Our, our partners at Produce UK will be running live performance uh, aspect of the show. Uh, they'll be recruiting in the summer or, or just before the summer of 2022. So um, the short answer to that is yes, and they are looking to bring in local creatives from each of the towns and cities as they can. Um, okay, so uh, um, are you interested in the perspective of immigrants who haven't been living in the UK too long? Or would you encourage creators to apply only if they have a strong connection to the location? Um, I would define strong connection as having a feeling about that place. I don't think it's determined by length of time. So I think if you're newly moved to an area, that would make you a great candidate to apply. Um, I do just have to flag, though, in order to take part in this scheme and be paid, you do need the right to work in the UK so we can pay you. But we are interested to hear from people who've moved to like locations recently as well as people who've been there historically for generations uh, so deborah so, you've mentioned people looking for next step are you still interested in people applying who have more experience um i think What's the answer? We are, this is essentially designed as something that is about taking people in, into mid-career. We wouldn't be looking for senior professionals. Um, we don't think, you know, we, we think also there's probably a, a limit as to how well the fee applies to senior professionals. But if you're coming from a, another background, for example, from television or theatre or film, and what you want to do is begin reimagining your career in an immersive landscape, then absolutely, you know, that kind of translates transitional translational piece is one of the things that story trails can offer um so i think if you want to have a specific chat about your individual circumstances deborah um do get in touch but um essentially aim for people's kind of like stepping into their mid-career and, and stepping up at that point or translating their careers from one field to immersive And hopefully, Holly, that sort of answers your question as well. You know, translational work. Um, you know, uh, that if you're looking to kind of go, well, I've got I've got experience within this one field, but I understand I'd have to perhaps, you know, sort of change my aspirations to move into mid-career moment for immersive, then this would apply to you. It is not a starting role, but it is not, you know, if you think about careers as kind of like, you know, beginning and end. It's more in the mid, in the middle um, and towards the beginning of, of middle careers, but it also translates a career from one sector to another. So we're trying to be open to allow people to explore this space as well. And that's what Story Features Academy has been doing for the last two years, helping people translate skills from one sector to the other. Um, a very important question we've had in is how important is community collaboration in the storytelling and story making? It's a really, really central aspect. Um, we're working with the library network across the UK because it's actually a really good um, way into local communities. It's the art media form that more people engage with compared to any other cultural format. And we're working closely with library staff to be given access basically to their facilities. And if you're picked for this scheme, we'd very much expect you to be using those locations for doing community outreach, for running focus groups, for doing interviews. It's not a case of just letting people loose and then picking who they want to talk to. We need to see um, sort of evidence that you really are engaging across the community. Um, and so a key skill in, in this project is the ability to identify, you know, who are the good people in the community to talk to, who can give you access to other people. So that's a really key question. Um, Jane, anonymous attendee, James, could you please elaborate more about a story as a dialogue between past and present? Does the story need to have historical background? Yeah, this is, a, this is an immersive history storytelling project. It is a story in which history is a key part. Um, but history doesn't mean like 100 years ago or 50 years ago. You know, we're interested in the recent past as well. But we're interested in using archive from the BFI and BBC to create dialogues between the past and present. This can be about what is in the archive, but also what is absent from the archive, 
how places have changed, how themes have changed, how attitudes have changed. Um, so the dialogue between past and present is something that is about using our archive as jumping off points for thinking about stories of today and how they link to the past. But very much, um, yeah, very much this history is a key part of this project. Um, anonymous attendee below that, would you consider shortlisting a recent graduate? If you meet the criteria of three years professional experience, then it depends, it depends what you've done before you graduated, uh, would be the answer. Um, but we are really clear on the criteria that you can find on the FAQs and the T's and C's. But just to iterate that, if you've been a student, maybe if you've been involved in the student radio or maybe you run a YouTube channel or you've got a podcast, if you've actually been creating content for a few years, you would be eligible. You don't have to have been in a full time paid job. You just need professional experience as in you create content. Um, wow, so many questions. Quite a lot of the questions are sort of being repeated now. A lot of them are about location. What if you're, you know, you don't have to come with a specific story idea connected to the specific location at this point of applying. If you get shortlisted for interview, you will get an application pack, which has got more information in. We just didn't want to flood you with information right now. So you don't need to have a story in order to apply at this stage. Um, so I think there's been a few questions that are sort of similar about kind of like essentially subtitling and um, uh, uh, um, for, for deaf or for non-English. And uh, the answer to that is yes, yes. Um, you know, stories not told in English or stories that we need to subtitle. Um, yes, those will be there. Um, so I uh, hope that answers that question, which I think David and Damien also uh, answered correctly. Um, Deborah, would the contract be around 75 days in total? Yes, I think that's correct. Yes. Um, um. Okay, I kind of think that we maybe have answered everything that's come in. Um, must the stories only be triggered by archive material? No, you can have, we would very much welcome you saying, here's some stories, there's no archive to back them up. That's exactly what we want to do with the immersive maps. And we would then get you to go and scan the place, the person or an object that would represent that. Um, and one other question was, how are you going to, is there going to be any help in like locating people to talk to in the places? And yes, we're going to be using the library network. We've got BBC local radios. We're going to be doing outreach. There will be help. You're not just on the ground looking for people. And in the training will also help with thinking around how to do that. Um if you don't think if you're still there it's it's just about half past two um we've tried to answer everything we can we've got like three minutes left i think we think we've answered the questions that are remaining so rather than repeat ourselves if there's anybody who you know if you think you haven't had your cancer question answered um uh then please put it in the chat again now um irene will creators be able to use several library venues no unfortunately um, we are, the, the library hub will be a library hub. There's a lot of work that goes into clearing everything that needs to happen. And these libraries need to be able to be the hosts to uh, a multimedia experience at the end. But during the collection phase, like creating stories, absolutely. But our final tour will take place in the, in the, in the, in the main Bradford library. Um, Deborah, thank you very much. Very kind. Thank you too, Sheena. <laughs> I keep saying thank you. I would um, say basic to everyone also, if you're thinking about it, just make the application. It's 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 a quite a quick application. And we're happy to engage in answer answering questions, but just get it in. If you need any help with the application, get in touch. Happy to chat and assist in any way we can. Um and we're really keen to have an open mind about who we take and how it works. So don't think I can't apply because of this. Just get an application in and then tell us, you know, what you're thinking. 
Um, thanks. All right, we are at 2.30. Um, so we're going to wave you all goodbye now. Um, and um, we hope to see lots of applications. We can't wait to, we can't wait to meet some of you and good luck. Take care. Okay. Thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you very much. Goodbye.